Another week, another Reign of Roses session, and our third Buddy Cop in a row. By serendipitous well, we've had now all three possible two-man band combinations between our three players. And, if the fires of war haven't forged a strong bond between Li Wei and Yannick Emerald, who knows what will. We begin with a post-dinner game. Everyone relaxing in the Grand Hall. Grandpa Delricker and Yannick play a game. Some Dworkin and Strauss von Bilden, a tiefling with ram's horns, who is also a baron, sit at the table with Siegrin. Everything is disrupted when a red cloud pierces the windows and the light swirls. A messenger descends and declares, in poofy hat with long-winded decree, a simple message. War. This is an imperial call to arms. A foe known as the Gold Pact assails the eastern border. The room swirls and is quickly decided as they enter the council chamber and arrange for the swift raising of all banners, but not before Yannick plays his final piece to win the game, that they must go and enkindle Yannick and his companions of the flame. Grandpa laughs and advises him as Sigrid announces it's time to enkindle them. Don't forget to look up. Li Wei and Yannick accompany Sigrid to the storage chambers below the castle. Ancient petrified timbers and vast stone columns surround them as they approach a spiral staircase down into the earth, hovered over by many deadly-looking rocks. Yannick's mother Ama arrives with a scroll case and stands by the courage. Those stones that are looking precariously ready to drop, and Yannick's father breaks out the family coat of honor from that scroll case, first shared with each member of the family when they are to be enkindled to the flame. What follows is a dungeon that is matched to the code and the primacy of its tenants. There's more to it, but the overall lesson of the nine lines is this. Seek glory, show courage, have honor, know loyalty, pursue perfection, and die well. As you may have guessed, they do not actually have to die well here, but they do kick swing down some shafts and spikes at the bottom along cool, slippery vine ropes. Down at the base of the dungeon, 100 feet below the floor of the Grand Hall, they come upon it, the lineal flame, an ethereal green crackling bonfire of energy and spirits. Yannick seeks his ancestors, sees them, and he and Li Wei reach in and seize power under Seagrin's watchful gaze. The spirits of the ancestors fly about, and one even pro-offers an emerald greatsword for Yannick's vision to him. Before it burns up in the flames, he reaches out for it. There's no avail. After that, the banners are called. They see the banners of their realm brought together. The hearth banner is there. They're standing forces of close and loyal forces. Beyond that, the banners of each province are presented, bringing their specialized troops and many peasants in tow. Besides, the banner of Kriots consists of the forces of Johann Pike and his many pikemen, Carlong Haftief and his outriders, the giant man, Gunter Weyrund, bringing his heavy ritters, and Ida Bao with her rangers. The banners of Twin River consist of three lords from that province, Yukushige Watano, Tenshi Zilbate, and Renho Masaoki. All but Renho bring Butai, Butai Ritters, medium armored fighters as good in the saddle as they are afoot with bow and blade alike. And Masaoki's oars accompany their namesake, bearing great blades fit for dehorsing the foe. Tenshi stands out due to wearing an angel mask, always, and a very angelically glittering blade known as Cloud Reaper. We get to see an action later. The banners of Koyalda comprise Bayran Scudder and Yella von Vergrave, who we got previews of in episode 2. They both bring archers, although Jella brings a more professional force than Bayran. The forces of the northern and southern... Uh, the northern and barren Borm consist of Haravar Redstone and Dwarfs, Professional Ashigaro, and Ritter Mixed Force, the Red Line whose veterans mark the numbers of campaigns they have seen through the number of lines on their arm. Anjan Vros Grezny stands out due to her ability to summon a magic sword, being a bit of a klutz, and making some eyes at our boy, Yannick. On the road, Yannick and her chat up some more about the enemy's forces, and he feels love maybe in the air. Li Wei plays wingman and steps back. She brings heavy ritters with her as well. From the Snake Coast comes the, only the sole banner of Zadan Thorslav, or the Boyar, and his Yama Jaegers, hardy warriors with axes and javelins. The whole group marches across the continent and joins with yet more forces of the Empire, these including the Batari Strelanders and the Batari of the Plains, who are Imperial allies in this conflict. A group has a bit of a tiff over linguistic misunderstanding, but Li Wei steps in. Batari is a dialect of Yang Tu, which he speaks. And after diffusing a harsh situation with a song, he's given a reciprocal gift. This is the Kanjali, or Eastern Sword Sword, known as Giltbur. The group 
travels and meets various forces and lords and learns about and studies the gold pact, the forces arrayed against them. They are a coalition force comprising of Batari tribes, forces from the Devuvian and various orc bands. The eastern dwarvish Vok, various Batari hosts, and winter elves from Devuvian join the empire against them. The color of the empire is Galena, silver with a purple hint that is derived from an ore composed mainly of lead. The emperor gives a grand speech to his assembled central forces headed east to relieve the imperial forces there, and the Rose Bears are probably not impressed. But he does remind them that Galena is mostly lead, and is established that this is a conflict of gold and silver. We establish that if an orc host were to break through from beyond, they would bring a full force of extra-dimensional invaders. And at the moment, they're simply an advanced squad with the Eight Gold Pact, possibly trying to reach an ideal point to summon their allies from across the stars en masse. If that happens, this campaign is going to be a lot longer and bloodier. The place of battle is a wide plain to the east of the Albarian Empire. They are to make ready the place of battle assigned to them by Commander Kamaria Shufu, a series of copsed hills near an ascent to a pivotal mountain where the temple has stationed potent thaumaturges to cancel magics of the most potent foe they face, Voidbender, who continues to wrest victory from defeat with their grand castings. Yannick leads the work teams in napping down the earth and to sharpen rock to make difficult for cavalry the ground and force them into the trap, channeling them into muddy lowlands and the southern area and building channels through those lowlands to muddy it more. He ascends the command hill, leeway that is, to deliver a speech after Eichen von Ordel lets him know the men are a bit shaken by the stories of Voidbender's terrible abilities upon the field. Sigrid admires his father's accomplishments and suggests that uh, he may be best at games, or rather his son's accomplishments. A newly treacherous statement, given that Albard's dying utterance was to ask who is best at games when asked who would succeed him. Sigrid is implying his son has what it takes to be emperor. Not an implication fans of the current ruler would ever take lightly. The day of battle comes. The Emerald Rose has their forces rallied in the woods surrounding their ambush U of a hillside. The enemy duel with their cavalry and half deeps outriders as they harry the foe, and after many arrows are shot, the main forces begin to approach. When the fullness of the foe meets their ambush, the trees pour out assailants and blood is shed left, right, and center. Veil blades, rangers, Yama Jaegers, and more emerging, mastering the difficult terrain to strike down their foe. Cavalry not nearly as suited to it. The battle is going well until a magical explosion makes it through the various defenses, skittering through the sky, and rips apart the center of their ambush zone. With their forces in disarray, Sigrid spurs the group forth, and they ride in to reinforce and rally the men. The group rides in, and the fight is going well. They slay an enemy captain, and his forces scatter. Blood flows, and in an instant a massive black hole rips across the sky. Everyone is tossed about and dazed. Yannick and Liwei struggle to their feet as Sigrid duels a Karteshk, an albino Kartek orc known for their religious significance. He has become a paladin and is exceedingly good at gaining glory through battle. Sigrid is wounded, and his foe is getting the better of him. Yannick tosses a javelin to his side, and it flies great and wide. His father is cut down, and Yannick, full of purpose, runs forth and slays his father's killer. Li Wei weighs what to do, although his options aren't clear to the audience. Matt and I know what his scroll is, but Judge Wolf, who is absent for 2.5, knows as much as the viewers. Nothing noticeable happens as he holds that resource in reserve. Then Isamu Cho and Guntu Weyerund and Yelavan Vergrave arrive. As the enemy seems ready to level them with the final charge of the elites, the Red Rose brings their gun line to bear, and volley after volley fells them and leaves the field chaotically asunder. In this moment, Enoch is ready to withdraw with his father's corpse as a hobgoblin hobgraf rides up on a giant lizard. Fly asks him simply, You're going to live every day of your life from now on, knowing what you did here today. Are you going to turn around and withdraw? Are you going to go up there and gut the man who gave the order that killed your father like a pig? I think we all already know what Yannick's answer was. Yannick, Liwei, and his companions ride forth. Tenshi Zilbate arrives and flies from his steed to cut down the enemy theaters, huge orcs known for their special abilities as mindbenders. Kenji Red pulls out eight guns and fires them each one after the other into the foes clinging around them next. That leaves Yannick, Liwei, and Flay to push through the destroyed camp and reach the foe. The enemy's command tent has been rocked by a strange explosion that also ruined the enemy camp, and they were in disarray. Voidbender is alone, and meets them with a brutal gravitational blow set to crush them all, 
that disappears with a chime of divine notes the instant before it can bisect the attic. A battle with a dark foe of screeching shadows and a cloak wielding gravitational power is an already gravely wounded, bound and be it battered, ensues. Li Wei and Yannick come in, and Yannick manages to finish it with a stupendous crit that decapitates his foe just as he sends out a shockwave that dehorses Li Wei. As the dust settles, he is heralded by Li Wei as King Yannick, and the assembled Graphian lords look on, not disagreeing with his assessment. On the way from the battlefield, the body of the prelate Shinai Nak is witnessed, sundered, and just the way he and Yannick and his companions would have been. An unexpected buddy cop with an amazing run by Judge Wolf through the opening dungeon. And I mean, wow, he picked up the code and quoted it all episode. Guy's incredible. We did not see as much of Li Wei's side of things this go-around, but I did manage to get him a cool magic item. And after 2.5, we both know he's got a lot going on. He had a poignant point when he looked back at the path of ambition, and yet called to him to remind him of loyalty, of the loyalty he'd shown the street urchins by saving them before himself when first they met, and how well loyalty had worked out for him thus far. I failed to properly showcase the battle system, but we have tutorial engagements slated for later, so I think we'll be fine. The pucks uh, looked all right, but the emerald ones will probably get a reskin to look better on dark green grasses, more common for the battlefields going forth than this lighter yellow-green plains. Overall, I'm just so excited. Um, Yannick is going to be a great father, just like Judge Wolf is, and uh, I think that Li Wei continues to cement himself in the upper strata of society, even as there are complications to that. And I know Faz is going to come back with a great one when we see what's in The Path Through Fire and War Part 2 in Episode 4. So, stay tuned.